Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. We got a big one on tonight, Anthony. A got big, a big guest. Um, yeah, he's uh, someone that a lot of people know. Yeah. <laughs> if by big, I mean he's not a, a huge guy or anything, but he's a... Not he's a not, not weight and or height, no. but uh, he's a big deal. I, this is the highest... A position we've had in the White House on the show, I believe, yep. right? Yeah. Um, he was the press secretary for Donald Trump. Yep. You know him as Mr. <laughs> Sean Spicer. Or Spice Dog. Spice as, Dog. As our producer likes to call him. Yeah, I love to call him that. Yeah. He's been calling that all day. He's like, man. As a matter of fact, dog we, we actually have a movement right now that we want to make that his new public nickname. We want people to refer to him as Spice Dog on, the, on a regular basis. So if you could Correct. go to anything that Sean Spicer posts in hashtag Spice Dog it yes. for the next six to seven years. Well, we would appreciate it. But let's very much. let's do it let's do it properly. It's uh, Spice Dog, so it's hashtag Spice and then D A W G. Of course, yeah. Uh, so go to, to Sean Spicer on on Instagram yeah. or Twitter and just say, "Hey, man, I heard you on Drinking Bros." Hashtag Spice Dog. And I'm gonna follow that hashtag. So anybody that posted, you're gonna be entered into a uh, contest to win some things. So. Yeah, and, and by the way, speaking of contest, we had it on Drinking Bros Sports this week. Uh, with the closer for the Diamondbacks and every, oh, they've been lighting his ass up. They lit him up so much. Like I haven't heard from him in a couple of days because his agent called me. He's doing some stuff, but he like uh, he he posted or he shared something with me on on Instagram earlier. Probably yeah. because he's just getting torn, burned down. By his his agent hit me up and was like, "Man, we had no idea how many listeners you had." And mm. I was like, I, "We're over nine million at this point. Mm. Um, it could be hitting ten by the end of this month." Uh, simply because we've been going Monday through Saturday, and that's not going to stop uh, until all of this is over. So we're here with you, and and luckily all the celebrities that we have on the show uh, are doing nothing at home. So we're we've been able to get some of the best guests of all time. I'm looking at his one of his recent posts on Instagram, and every single comment is hashtag Drinker Bros. Not <laughs> I'm not that's not hyperbole. Every single comment. Is hashtag Drinker Bros. Say say his Instagram handle. For it's him. Uh, Archie Bradley spelled the traditional ways uh, seven. A R C H I B R A D L E Y seven. Hashtag sorry not sorry. No fuck him. Archie. Uh, find is Spicer on there? Is he on Instagram? I'll do the sponsors real quick at the top. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, see if Sean Spicer's on there. I'm sure he's on here somewhere. We definitely need to go to Sean Spicer's and say, hey man, we heard you. On yeah, it's Sean Bros. Sean M. As in Mike Spicer. I don't know that Mike is his middle name. I'm just saying. And yeah. It's like phonetic alphabet. Sean M. Spicer. Go. S-E-A-N-M-S-P-I-C-E-R. Yeah. And, you know, just make sure that there's some hashtag Drinking Bros on there. Or, no, I'm sorry, hashtag. Uh, uh, Spice Dog. Spice Dog. Yeah. We heard you on Drinking Bros. Hashtag Spice Dog. Yep. Uh, we got some sponsors before we get to Sean that pay for this whole shit wagon to be on the air. First and foremost, talking about ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Talk to Rich today. Everything is still 25% off at ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. And they said they're going to extend this through the rest of the quarantine. So, hmm. um, look. We don't even know how long that is, by the way. We don't. And they're guessing till May. But, like, hmm. these, this was supposed to end a couple weeks ago. And they were like, look, man, everybody's stuck inside, stuck at home. Uh, 25% off of everything, and, uh, and we got you. So that's mattresses, sheets, pillows, adjustable bases. And as always, you can use that 36-month page. You go program no interest with that and, uh, and get whatever you want at, at ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. And it, it'll knock it down if you get an, a mattress like 25 bucks a mm. month or something like that. So it's great. And again, no interest. Uh, next up, we got killcliffcbd.com. Let's face it. If you're stuck inside <laughs> and you're... On a mattress. You might as well be drinking 25 milligrams of CBD. Yeah. Uh, look, you, the kids are running around. It's chaos, dude. It's madness. You, you got to gotta take the edge off. A little bit, yeah. Take that edge off. Um, and if you've got some injuries, if you, your joints are sore, um, this will certainly help with it because uh, you can't get to your doctor or whatever. Yep. And you will not piss hot on any drug test. Um, it is all completely THC free. So go to killcliffcbd.com today. Type in the promo code Drinking Bros. That gets you 30% off and free shipping. It is a monster savings. It is. Um, knocks it down to like 250 a can for a case on this shit. And uh, it's the best, man. They got grape, uh, orange kush. My dad actually asked for it for his birthday. 
Um, Jerry. So Maybe do something more for his birthday than a case of Kill Cliffs. I did. I got him two cases of Kill Cliffs. Mm, so that's coming go. your way, my man. Dead serious. And I use my <clears> own, <throat> own promo code. No lie. You're I use real, Drinking Bros. Yeah. You're a real piece of shit. <laughs> 30% off at KillCliffCBD.com. Um, promo code Drinking Bros. Get you that 30, dog. And that free shipping. I've been uh, paying a lot of attention to my grooming. I know you have. Because I can't get my fucking hair cut. So you like. And the beard is really coming out. It is. It's too big. I'm going to have to trim it up this weekend probably. Uh, but it takes so long to do it that I'm, I'm waiting. Um, Does somebody else typically do it? No, I always do it myself. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, I'm, I. So if you can't cut your hair short, then you got to stay. I'm taking like eight showers a day right now, dude. It's fucking ridiculous. Like, come on, man. Every time I get a little sweaty, I want to get a shower because I have this like sweaty hair on my fucking neck. It's well, disgusting. If you're in Georgia, uh, South Carolina, or Tennessee <clears throat> today, you're open for biz, my man. And the barbers are open. Uh, but if you can't get to your barber... And you need to shave your bush. Yeah, go to Manscaped. Manscaped.com. Uh, everybody who's like, we started with them what two weeks ago. Everybody who's gotten this is like, this is the greatest product it on is. the planet. I it don't understand why this didn't exist. It's the best. I don't know why no one thought of putting a ceramic blade on a fucking shaver before for your nuts. Yeah. Uh, but thanks, Manscaped, for doing that. Thanks, man. Like, I don't even care. They have a lot of other great products. I don't care about any of them just because this one is so good. But like, this, yeah. Yeah. Trim, you look, you trim up your balls, trim up your pubes. <laughs> And it says that on the box, by the way. So it's not us even being crass. No, it says their their slogan is uh, "Manscaped, your balls will thank you." Yes, they don't give a shit, and it's true. Yeah, it's well, true. It's the best in the biz. It's a kit, so you get it. You have the kit from Manscaped. Mm -hmm. You you keep it with you. It's got a nice. It's it's, it's actually really nice. It's like a really nice top yeah, kit that comes that with is. it. Zip it up. Keep it at the bottom of the thing. And like, look, I go uh, balls. I go every two months. Uh, pubes. I go once about every six months. I don't have a lot of hair. Um, but uh, I still got to keep it trim. I'm a normal human being, so I trim on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I, I'm a grown man with body hair that can grow a beard. Not, things like uh, that. I can't grow a beard. No. Can't grow, grow a powerful mustache. Can't grow a beard. No. Uh, so go to manscaped.com. Uh, promo code Drinking Bros gets you, what, 20% off there? Yep. Whew. Your balls will thank you. Yeah, they really will, man. And, and it's worth it. And it's, it's one of those products where everybody has gotten this now since yeah. we've, we've started with them. I feel like almost doing a contest at this point of people where somebody has to like do something weird. Yeah, with, with, shaving with some the, bolts, like a lightning some, bolt into their pubes. Yeah, something like shave. I, here's a challenge. Can you, can you shave the letters HIV into your pubes and then go out and get laid by somebody you've never met before. That's a good challenge. Like if you're bored, like look, not that you can go out right now anyways, but this shit's going to be over soon. Plus yeah. you could use Tinder. Yeah. Get on Tinder, put one of the pictures is just you pulling your pants down a little bit. There's nothing exposed, but your pubes say HIV and that's your only picture and see how many people match with you and then send me the results. See what it is. Yeah. And, and look, if you actually do it, we will send you a free kit from manscapes.com. Uh, again, promo code Drinker Bros, 20% off there. Last but not least, DukeCannon.com. This one came from you guys. Um, yep. This wasn't even us. You, you guys asked for a promo code for Duke Cannon. Everybody uses Duke Cannon. They're a veteran-owned company, and uh, they always give back a portion of their proceeds at the end of the year to veterans charities. You guys said this was the best in the business. We reached out to them. Uh, you've always used them. They're new to me, mm -hmm. and God damn it, if they're not the best, man, um, Duke Cannon's got the best body wash on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, yeah, it smells really good. It's almost like using a cologne, too, man. I mean, it's, it's on all day. They call it thick. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, the uh, liquid body wash. It's really good. I mean, it's... Um, you only need about a dime size, man. It's really thick. Yeah, well, it depends on your body, right? Yeah, I'm very smooth. I really got to get in there. Yeah, you do. I like to lather up. You're I like a quarter size. I'm a dime size. Do you remember guy. that scene in Mr. Deeds where the guy was... Just soaping his ass up the whole time yeah. in the shower. Yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> I stare at myself in a full, I have a full length mirror in my bat, in my uh, uh, shower. Uh -huh. And I just stare at myself, lock eyes with myself, and soap myself. Yeah, and Duke Cannon. Yep. Man, is there, is there a better way to live your no. life? There's not. Go to dukecannon.com and uh, use the promo code <laughs> Drinking Bros. And that's 15% off there at the Dukester, right? The Dukester. Uh, and look, all of these guys, these big guys here, because they're on the desk, um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge container of, yeah. of body wash. So it's nine bucks a piece. So if you're thinking, dude, why is it nine bucks? It's huge. Like, like this will last forever. Um, so it's nine bucks a piece for this, and then you can get all four for 30 and uh, free shipping. 
So you get 15% off for free shipping. It's a good deal. The promo code Drinking Bros <laughs> at uh, DukeCannon.com. And again, you guys asked for it. We reached out and uh, they agreed. Yep. Uh, D'Anthony. Wait. Yeah. Make sure if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. Yes. S- subscribe because we have, we keep hearing we're about people. We're now. trying. Yeah, we're trying to figure out uh, why our shit isn't getting served to a larger audience. Mm-hmm. We have some people working on it, but we're running some tests. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel uh, and let us know if you get like the live notifications or let us know how far like you can look on YouTube and see when um, something was posted. That it was yesterday or six hours ago or whatever it is. Let us know how long it took you to get a notification through either your phone or your fucking desktop yeah, or laptop or whatever it is. Before. And then hit the like button bu- button on yeah. YouTube. Uh, hit that like button on YouTube. That Hammer is. it. That does that'll, that'll jam it up the charts, uh, apparently. For those of you that don't know, uh, when YouTube first serves out a new piece of content from any channel, it takes a sample size, usually about 10% of that channel, mm-hmm. and it serves it to them first. And based on how they interact with it, it serves it to more and more people. Yeah, That's usually how the algorithm works. Um, so the more you like, comment, and view earlier in the process that helps technically or theoretically speaking i don't know yeah. youtube changes shit all the time yeah. but that's what we know that works but anyways we're trying to figure out why our shit isn't getting served to a much larger audience we so think like, it was it was alex jones but let's face it i mean look we have sean spicer on today we've had yep. milo on I mean, we've got mm-hmm. a bunch of controversial guests mm-hmm. on in the past a bunch of porn stars too uh so we don't know what it is uh but uh, subscribe to drinking bros podcast on youtube all of the shows in our media company are on there uh, Drinking Broettes, Ross Patterson Revolution, Savage Saturdays, everything is on that channel. And uh, we're basically running it like a TV network mm-hmm. at this point. I mean, we're on close to four or five hours out of the day. Uh, and we're here with you through the quarantine. Uh, here is Sean Spicer. Sean Spicer, welcome to Drinking Bros. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Look, you're, you're dressed up today. And it, it, we're just a couple of dirty carnies over here on this side. I got a show to do. So you know, what I wear, what I wear to work and what I wear going home is not what I wear on set. So of course, yeah. of course. I mean, we're not wearing pants right now. Neither of us. So I don't know what's going on at your place. Uh, but. Let me show you. Neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For, for the two of us over here, I'm, we wear like sweatpants every day. Cause yeah. the audience only sees us from here up, obviously. Yeah. So I go home and my child, and I don't know if you're the same, but my child is always like, man, dad, what do you do for a living that you're in sweatpants every day? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, like I said, when I go to work, they're going, where are you going? And I go, I'm going to work. And they're like, dressed like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, break it down, I, gotta, I just carry it. So I've got a suit and shirt, but I don't want to wear that all day. I'm only on air at six o'clock. Right. Yeah. I mean, you should. I mean, from this angle, you could get a suit that stops like right around the rib cage. You could wear a midriff suit, is what I'm saying. No one, would, no one would ever know. You know those tux t-shirts? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the old cousin Eddie's. Uh, it's what oh, we yeah. like to call them yeah. in the biz. Yep. Uh, Sean, what do you what do you like to go by? Our, our young producer was calling you Spice Dog all day. He was getting ready for the interview today, calling yeah. you Spice Dog. You, you got any crazy nicknames that you go by? Uh, no, that that's not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make it a thing. I'm sorry. I apologize right. in advance. Spice Dog is a good name. We're going to get jerseys made. A lot. I, of all the things that have been called, that's that's not even halfway on the bad scale. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I, well. I can only imagine. Um, because I, I feel like with you in particular, you were the first guy who was actually cool at doing that gig in the White House um, and, and seemed to have a good time with it, whereas everybody else was was completely – 100 percent serious all the time like you've gone on to do uh you know a ton of interviews and dancing with the stars and and all that stuff (laughs) um do you feel like you changed the game as far as that that went um i don't think so no because i think that when trump leaves office whatever that is at some point they're going to come back and it'll revert back Mm -hmm. to exactly this it's just i think it's trump it's a reflection of him he's disruptive by nature and so the people around him i think tend to exhibit similar qualities to how they conduct themselves. I mean, in the sense that he, he was, you know, going back and forth with the media. And I think he wanted his team to do that as well. So, but I, and I don't think any other politician is going to come in and do the same kind of thing. Right. right. Do you enjoy, like, did you enjoy that job looking back at it now? Uh, do you miss it at all? No, never. <laughs> I don't know if anybody that's ever had that job misses it after they're done. So, so here's the thing. There's, there's two things I would say to you. The first is um, when I left, and I think this is true for any job, and I've had, you know, I've worked at Capitol Hill, I've worked on, is 
you have to, if it's a job that you love, you have to leave when you're, when you're ready, meaning that you're not going to walk out and go, God, I regret, I regret. And when I left the white house, I felt like, you know, for lack of a better phrase that I checked every box. I, um, and that leads into my second point, which is like, I, I grew up as a working class kid in Rhode Island. Uh, I, I, when I say I never, like, this wasn't even a dream of mine in, in the sense that I was like, there's no way I could ever do that. Right. I mean, it's, I had an equal chance of doing that as I did of playing in the NBA and I'm five, six. Um, <laughs> So, so it was sort of to me, like every day I was there was sort of this like, Hey, pinch yourself. It's pretty cool. And, you know, so when I left, I was ready. I knew that wasn't my initial plan when I, how long I want to stay, but mm-hmm. I knew I'd hit a sweet spot and I was like, okay, go. Yeah. Cause we, we've had some friends, Dan and I that have, that have worked in the white house. Um, and they've all said the same thing of like, you've got to leave when you're ready and on your terms and, and get out before the job gets you essentially yeah. and uh both of our friends have left on their own terms mm-hmm. when they were ready to go obviously the media will spin in another way yeah. um but uh the, the the two friends that we've had in the trump administration have left on their own terms and they didn't really have too many negative things to say about them and i don't know if that's the same you case know, with you but, but the one thing that people have to understand is i i spent i mean look 21 years in the military six years at the rnc doing two presidential cycles so i've seen some pretty intense jobs what happens in the White House is not even comparable. It is a level of intensity mm. and, frankly, scrutiny <laughs> that doesn't exist, I don't think, anywhere else. Um, and it's it, that is, that happens probably with any candidate, mm-hmm. but I think with Trump, much more so on like an exponential level. Yeah, because, I mean, as you were going through it personally, um, you know, Trump gets into office, there's so much contention. Uh, the, 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 the country, the media, everybody's uh, against him, it seems like. And then they're focusing on you every single day to deliver the news to everybody. I, besides Trump, I, I had you as the number two job of the most pressure probably in the United States at that time. There, there are probably some days and that that yeah. was not disputed. <laughs> well, what do you, you, you mentioned uh, something about the way Trump does business. What do you think it is, aside from the obvious things, that sets him apart from other politicians? Because I know like some things that I've heard from people that have worked directly with him one he had uh like the pdb reduced to a much smaller file than than it has been in the past and i i mean he his from what i understand his uh his point by doing that was like i can't consume this amount of information you have to fucking give me the bluff give me the bottom line up front and all these things and then we'll follow which trails we need to which kind of makes sense to me i think he took it i don't i don't know how far down he took it but like aside from the obvious shit that everybody knows about from the media what would you say is different about him as a politician yeah, I mean, well, there's first thing, let me just address what you said off the bat, which is, and I think because people always made this deal about how he got his presidential briefing, and it's like, who cares? Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you're, I'm a much more visual person. Like, so mm-hmm. I, if I have to tie a tie, I watch a YouTube video, and, and you could sit there <laughs> and show me step by step picture, you know, directions on a piece of paper. But if I can see it visually, it's a much easier way for me to process information. Right. So why do we really care how somebody processes it as long as they're getting it? Right. But to your, to your question, I mean, look, I, and I'd worked, uh, for George W. Bush as the assistant U.S. trade rep, and, and there was there's much more of a structure to the White House. Trump is a decision maker, mm-hmm. um, in the sense that normally the process works its way up. It's very iterative. It goes through a process, and then it goes through a deputies committee, and then up, and then the president gets to be like, hey, we've all met for 30 days, and here's a decision that there's massive consensus. Trump wants, like, you'll hear a lot of times, he'll bring two sides into the office and say, okay, fight it out in front of me. Mm-hmm. And you'll know, read all these stories about contentious, but, but what he's trying to do is get the best ideas from both people and say, okay, I want you to answer why that's not the best idea right here. So I hear it, I see it, you're, you're held accountable for position because it, it, and, it and, and again, I'm not saying one's better than the other. It sort of depends on, on your leadership style, on your decision-making process. And so he's very different in that sense that, you know, you would never walk into the Bush White House or probably the Obama White House for that matter and say, Mr. President, I have an idea, da 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 in the Trump White House, you know, he wants to hear things. He doesn't want you to wait until it's bubbled all the way up to the top. And it's like, you know, here's what we've all decided you should be doing. And that's a very different style. And you say, I mean, obviously you said you don't, you're, you're not saying if it's better or worse, but I mean, it has to be better or worse. So which well, is, like, like, is he your, what's your preference on that? Yeah, I mean, ultimately what he's trying to build is an idea meritocracy, right? Where the ideas went. No, I, I liked it because... I think that when you have a good idea, instead of having to go through 
you know, eight different layers to find out if it can get there or not. You know, you can go straight to him and say, you've said you wanted to achieve this goal. I've got two ways to do it. Here they are. And, you know, you know, I, you know, he, he's going to challenge you on it. Don't get me wrong. Have you met with everybody? What do they say? Da, da, da. So he's going to make you go through the same process, but you're not going to go through 18 levels and meetings to do it and, and hope that the person, you know, the next step up, because you know, it's funny when we're going through this coronavirus pandemic right now. And when they talked about putting someone in charge, you know, they, Trump picks Mike Pence. Right. And there's a lot of people who push back on that. So, oh, is he the right guy? And I'm thinking to myself, if you need to get something done in government, you want to go to the highest level as often as you can. Because if you're the secretary of an agency and you're trying to use resources from another agency, you know, sometimes it's like, well, stay out of our wheelhouse. That's, that's, this is our lane. That's your lane. Mm -hmm. No matter what you've been trying, even if what you're trying to do is the best. And by going with the vice president, it's like he can just clear the hurdles on everything and say, get it done. And I think that that's what I was, I always find appealing with Trump is he's like, I don't really care about these excuses that, you know, this agency is supposed to do this and that one does that. That's just not getting it done for the American people. So screw it, figure out how to make it work, knock down that wall, knock down this process, get through it and get it done. And I don't want to hear about why you can't. I want to know that you did it. And I, I think that there's something appealing about that because there's so many times where somebody, because for a turf war, for whatever reason, stop something that's happening because, well, it's going to diminish their power or it's going to go into their wheelhouse. I, I, and I think that that's, that's not what we want. I want an effective and efficient government. And there's too often times where because of the bureaucracy that things that should happen don't. Mm -hmm. So there, there's just something that's refreshing about going, okay, if it's something good, if it should happen, I can probably get it to move, move forward. Right. Uh, speaking of COVID-19, what is your personal opinion on how Trump is handling this crisis right now? Um, because, you know, it's if you go from Biden and Pelosi, who were saying, you know, oh, he's a racist, he's a xenophobe for for shutting down travel from you know, you know China coming in to now it's Trump didn't do it fast enough. Uh, everybody seems to have a different opinion. What's your personal opinion on, on how he's handling this crisis? So I think what you just described, first of all, to address that, there's all these folks who it, I have revisionist history. You're right. I didn't call it xenophobic that he was shutting down. And now they're like, he didn't do it enough. And it's like, well, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that what he did was wrong yeah. and, and slowed this, the, the, you know, slowed the, the flow of this virus. Um, and then at the same time hit him for not doing enough. It's like, pick one thing, Nancy Pelosi, the same thing. There's this, the video that's been floating out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so the, the, the president didn't act enough. And it's like, really, because you're out there saying that, Bill de Blasio in New York saying a similar thing. And I'm yeah. not blaming them for, because I think we all acted with the information we had at the time, but then don't be hypocritical about it. Right. And that's what I, and, but so as far as how the president's doing, um, I, I think generally speaking right now for the last several weeks, they've been doing a really good job. They've been out there leading, getting the, the PPE and all the other equipment and things to the right places. And I, I think this is the other tale that's not getting done. When you look at Europe in a lot of those countries in terms of if you take like France, Great Britain, um, Germany, add them all together, you get about 238 million people, and you look at what their caseload was, then you look at the U.S. caseload, we have much fewer cases, we have a much low mortality rate, our mortality rate is about 1.5, 1.6%, I mean, it fluctuates. Theirs is 3.5 to 4, and so in a lot of these countries, and you go, okay, well, if they're doing such a great job, which is what the media would tell us, that we should look to them to the solution, then why do we have fewer cases and why are we bending the curve and the mortality rate so much lower? Mm. And I think once in a while, you either have to give the guy credit and say, okay, he actually did a good job and this is and here are the results. Because that just doesn't add up. You have one or the other has to be true. And if we're going to say he's not doing a good job, then show some data because right now the data does show that even at the low end of these curves these, that they said that they were going to, that we would face, He's well below that, right? right? They were talking about hundreds of thousands of cases, and you know, and again, every death, every sickness is 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 too many. But there's always this, you know, next bar that he has to jump over. Yeah. Okay. So well, they're moving the goalposts. Yeah, on a regular basis. Right, and, and yeah. I, look, and I'll tell you something that I I, I got to be careful because I don't have the answer to this question. But it's really funny. For the longest time, Cuomo was going, "I need forty thousand ventilators," and I'm sure, like I I think the guy was probably doing as, as governor. You know, he wants to protect his people. I get that. I know harm. He's trying to get as much as he can. And Trump goes out and says, you know, I don't think he needs that many. I'm going to get him what he needs. Da, 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 da. 
And everyone comes out and says, I cannot believe this. Well, the little data that I've seen doesn't look like New York came anywhere close to that number. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, at some point go back and say, wait a second, he got hit for this. Mm -hmm. So who was actually wrong? And I'm not, I hate this thing because I don't think that, like, I, as I said earlier, I, I don't think that this is a political game to figure out who scored more points than yeah. someone else. But I do think that, that at some point you go back and say, okay, Trump said X, the curve didn't bend as far as anybody, you know, believed it would. Number two, um, the mortality rates down. Number three, as far as ventilators and everything else, his, did we do the best job ever? No. Did, could we have gotten stuff to people? Yes. It's not a perfect process, but when you go back and look at the big hits that he's taken, it's not as bad as I think a lot of folks in the media and, and on the left hit him. Well, I think that's a problem, the media. So it's, it's, it's not going to be uh, – Congress people and senators and, and various others aren't going to just like come out and make – they're not going to call a press conference and say, hey, Trump did a good job on this issue. It's people from the media – it's, it's like you've, you've worked in politics. You know that you can make the results of a poll say whatever the fuck you want. You know what I mean? If you word the questions in a certain way, you can well, get yeah, the answers that you sure desire. Yeah, so it's like the media does the same thing. I can ask you 10 questions and get you to say some shit that you don't necessarily mean, but in, out of context, it sounds like that. Just by like, and if right. if every single one of the well, questions well, is, I, how, do you think, is how do you think Trump fucked this up today? Well, how do I respond to that? You know yeah. what I mean? And, and also, I think it's also... There is an intention, an intention to claim stuff and to sensationalize stuff. Mm -hmm. And so you can basically bait someone with eight questions. And on the ninth one, you're trying to get them to say something that creates this moment for you. So it's not a question of getting out the news. It's a mm -hmm. question of the moment. And this, the fights that they pick between the president and the governors is a prime case. So the president go out there, do what he needs to do. The governors are saying, hey, the president is doing a good job. And they'll come and say, yeah, but you know, the, the, here's what he did say, and trying to figure out how can I get the governor to say something negative about Trump thing, be able to go back to Trump and say, Hey, this governor said something negative. And then right. we start a problem. <laughs> as opposed to at the end of the day, right now, the president has been praising some of these governors. The governors have been saying, that's what we should want. And I think the press has a, an instinct to say, okay, good doesn't sell. We need, we need conflict. We need controversy. Right. We need sensationalism. I think uh, Walter Cronkite ruined America. <laughs> Honestly, I think he did, and here's why. Explain he, he, your theory to Sean. He this took, is a, a really funny one. He took a stand from – he took an editorial stand on Vietnam. I, he was right that we should have never been there in the first place probably or that we should have at least gotten our people out earlier. He was correct, technically right about that. But from his position as a member of the media, the most trusted man in America is what he was referred to for a very long time. Mm -hmm. He took a hard political stance on something – in an editorial way from a position as a newsman, the newsman. And ever since then, it's been downhill. And All right. You're, you're right. It has been downhill since. But let me, let me throw a, a, a different angle at you. Okay. All these guys, and you're right, think about this, just what you were saying. Cronkite's this guy that everyone trusts, and they think he's um, straight down the middle, tell you how it is, here are the facts. And he did have an agenda, right? And we saw it. At, at one point when he starts talking about what he thinks and believes, right? right. Sam Donald did that a little while ago. He came out and endorsed, I forgot, I think he endorsed Biden. It doesn't matter. People, <laughs> oh, doesn't this undermine journalism? And Donaldson's like, well, we all have opinions. And, and someone was asking me about that, and I gave a similar answer, which is, you know, the funny thing is these guys fake like they don't have biases. And everyone goes, oh, they're journalists. They're mm -hmm. just down the middle. BS. They all, like, you look at every single one of these polls, there's well over 90% of them are liberals. And at least if they were honest about their leanings, then it would, we would, then, then it would, to me, a, but be a much more honest discussion. Right. But this fakeness of saying, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't have an ideology and I don't vote. Well, I don't really, I mean, that's ridiculous. The, these guys are, are 90% plus on the left, believe in these causes. Um, and, and again, I, it's like, fine, it's a free country, but don't pretend to be neutral and unbiased. You are biased. You do have an agenda. You do believe things. And at least Donaldson, and I give him credit for being honest about it, because there's no one that can say, oh, I'm going into journalism. Therefore, I don't think about issues anymore. Right. What? That, that's a, just mm -hmm. a stupid proposition. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, uh, to circle back on, on how the president's doing, in my own personal opinion, We've never seen or faced anything like this as a nation in the history of our country. Republican or Democrat, I don't care who's in there. It's a tough call either way uh, to, to try to decide how to run this, how, to, how many ventilators to give to states, uh, when to reopen the country, all of it. In, in my opinion, Trump is doing a fantastic job. 
But, you know, regardless of, of if he was in there or Obama's in there, I would still support the president. And I feel like a lot of these governors, in particular Cuomo out of New York, feels like he's running his own pre-presidential campaign in case Biden dies before the convention uh, to get in there. Because certainly there's been a lot of talk behind the scenes of let's draft Cuomo in case something happens to Biden. Yeah, well, first things first, I think Cuomo, again, I'm with you. When you face a crisis, whatever it is, a natural disaster, a pandemic like we're facing, or you're dealing with a national security crisis, I don't really care what party they are. I want you to keep the country safe. I want Mm -hmm. you to take us in the right direction. Okay, so I agree with you. I I spent six years at the RNC, and I always said that, like, you know, I I don't agree with Barack Obama's policies, but he's the president, he's the commander in chief, Mm -hmm. and that's that's how our country works. That's why we are a great country. Um, And so I think that Cuomo's doing a good job. His his state is at the heart of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so for him to be out there every day talking about what he is doing to alleviate it is, frankly, what people want to see. I mean, that's his job, right? I mean, he's like an E7 in the military. His job is to get beans and bullets for his troops. His troops happen to be citizens and they need shit that's his job so if he's out there complaining that he's not getting shit that's not a slight on the president he's just leveraging his authority and power to get the shit that his people need that's not but the media is going to report that a certain way right that's right and that's the thing that and and that you're right because what's happening is they're creating these controversies he goes out and says i need 18 ventilators and go oh trump's not giving him 18 ventilators yeah Yeah. what the fuck no No one said that (laughs) right he has a right in fact to your point the job is to explain to the, his citizens in his state what he's doing what he needs how mm-hmm. he's going to do it that's his job and i think he's been doing a good job of doing that i think these infighting things are, are basically a lot of them are created let me, let me just ask this answer the second piece of that question though mm-hmm. there's a lot of these folks about who's saying oh cuomo's running this race um a i think that's a very cynical way of looking at this because it's it's like if he wasn't doing it would that i mean like this is you know what i mean he's doing his job mm-hmm. right um but also from a political standpoint, look, Joe Biden has spent an entire lifetime literally trying to be president. He is not stepping aside. He is the Democratic Party's nominee. He is going to choose a female vice president. And that's it. End of story. And when I watch pundits on TV talk about, well, this is Cuomo's tr- attempt to like it's it doesn't work that way. It, it's it's literally like saying, here's my attempt to go get drafted tomorrow at the NFL. Yeah. You know, I'm going to stand <laughs> Like, okay, well, that guess what? That's not how the process works. You're never going to – right? So the process does not work in either party that someone just goes, oh, you know what? We screwed up. Let's get the other guy in. Like, hey, okay, we tap in. Go. You, I you're think up. it's only it, happened it, once in the history of this country where there was some kind of situation like that that happened at one of the conventions. But, but remember, modern modern politics, like post-1974 – Yeah, yeah, the, never. The, it, it might, it, the system has changed mm-hmm. from the days of Akron Deal where, you know, there was – the, the a way that you went and gathered up delegates and mm. then it went to this convention right now. It doesn't allow for that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you this since we're, we're, we're talking about Biden. Who is his VP? Um, my prediction was Warren. You said uh, Kamala I, Harris. I think it's Kamala Harris cause she's the one yeah. that filed the pack with the DNC. And that usually is that's that, during a presidential cycle. That usually is someone that's running for president or vice president. That's why I think that that's the case. So here, here, here's my theory on VPs, vice presidents, um, cement your standing with your base they do not uh, vice presidents do not add they just never have you can go back through history mm-hmm. and, and there's some debatable moments and whatever so again let's look back a second so you know um cheney added some foreign policy chops to bush he had been a governor people wanted to know that you know he had this foreign policy and the defense uh chops as president so okay then you go to obama what well, he was a new senator biden had you know, been chairman of the uh, senate foreign relations mm-hmm. committee some cemented this thought on the base that, okay, he can handle foreign policy because they have Biden run. Mike Pence cemented the evangelical vote around Trump, right? You need to make sure that your base is solid and, and, and wants to go forward. So what does that mean? That means that Biden needs to look to the progressive left and the and areas where he needs to, to get his base energized. Mm-hmm. So he's already said it's a woman. So let's we can take that off the table. And then I think, look, the top choice is Elizabeth Warren. I don't know that she adds anything to mm. his, to right? Yes, there's a little bit of a, uh, a progressive cause, but she's no Bernie Sanders. She no. does not have the following, mm. the Bernie bros. There's no like Warren bros. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, 
and, and so that, that, that it's not like she shores up anything else, right? And then some people talk about Bro- Michigan government. What about Brokahannis? Ah, Brokahannis would be a good one. Yeah. The Brokahannis. <laughs> there you go. But I, I agree. I think that Kamala Harris is the pick because um, she she's been attorney general. She's fairly young. She's charismatic. Mm-hmm. She's got the street cred because she had been attorney general. She's a United States senator. So that she fits that narrative of can she start day one, right? Which some people talk about Stacey Abrams in, in Georgia. And frankly, I just don't think she passes the test. Me neither. Being a, right. Being a state rep. And again, someone said to me the other day, well, Trump wasn't, but he ran a large international corporation. Yeah. It's a little different being mm-hmm. a state rep in Georgia. And, and again, fair enough. Maybe some people disagree with that. But I think if you're Joe Biden and you're saying, I want my running mate to be able to step in day one, mm-hmm. so he's got no federal experience um, and nothing above representing a state district, maybe he thinks differently, but I don't see him going that direction. I think Kamala Harris fits all that stuff. Plus, the African-American women are a huge, huge voting block in the Democratic base. And so shoring that up, getting that rock solid, and Kamala Harris has, you know, like I said, she's got a lot of chops because she'd been attorney general and stuff. And I think she she actually cements that that progressive um, minority base that is crucial for his election. If you guys are wrong, though, I get to play this clip over and over and over again, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, but if it is it's Kamala the worst Harris, thing I have. that's the word. <laughs> uh, it's just for me personally. Uh, look, they don't call me R- Rostradamus for nothing. Speaking of speaking of clips, by the way. Uh, what tell me about <laughs> Saturday Night Live? Uh, you know that that shit was really funny, and your response was really yeah. funny. I enjoyed the way all that went down. To be honest, with Melissa McCarthy so playing I'm curious, you, yeah. from your perspective, how it all went down because it like you were a good sport about it, and and then Saturday Night Live usually goes over the line. Then somebody yeah. like Dan Crenshaw, for example, becomes a good sport about it, and then they kind of walk it back a little bit. So I'm curious how what your situation was like. Yeah, the funny thing about, by the way, that I love about the Dan Crenshaw thing, of course, it didn't get any doubt. They attack Crenshaw. Uh, he he is like magnanimous and amazing, and that's yeah. why Dan Crenshaw is the guy he is, right? And and then not only <clears throat> says hey, don't worry about it, but then when Pete Davidson has a very tough, difficult moment in his life, it's Dan Crenshaw that reaches out to him, right? And then what happens a few months later? Crenshaw, uh, Dan Pete Davidson says, "I take back my apology." Yeah, like so. I just look, I think the Saturday Night Live thing for me, um, I, I tell people there's a lot of emotions that went into that. Number one, I did think the first one was funny. I agree with you. It started to go over the line. It was it went mm-hmm. from funny to being like really personal and yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it lacked humor mm-hmm. going forward. But, you know, it was difficult because as a press secretary, if you're ever the story, you're a problem. And so when right. I saw it, I was laughing about it. And then I'm like, oh, crap, mm-hmm. I'm done. <laughs> you know, it, when, when someone starts like parroting you, that's never like you don't walk in Monday and they go, hey, we're giving you a promotion. You yeah. just got made Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Let's make you a bigger lightning rod than you already are. Right yeah. yeah. So, um, it was uh, it was a, it was, you know, it was, it was kind of difficult to see that happen. It's a very iconic show. <laughs> you suddenly see yourself get parried on it. You're like, oh, God. And it was, like I said, it was not for like the best reasons in the world. Mm. It wasn't like they were like, hey, let's make fun of the guy who, you know, cured some disease they were making fun of me because i had a couple you know i had some bad days mm. and uh so it was you know that that's what i'm saying this mixed sense of okay it's funny but you know it just it was a reminder that there's uh wasn't always a, a perfect day in there did melissa mccarthy ever reach out to you and say hey man what do you what did you think about this or how did you feel about this have you ever seen her in real life because i would imagine you know with all the stuff you've done afterwards you would have to have bumped into her at some red carpet or some event afterwards so I opened the Emmys in 2017 mm-hmm. and she was in the front row and I, you know, it was funny. I, it's just how I am. Um, she was in the front row after I did, after I opened the Emmys, they bring you back and my seats were probably, I don't know, two or three rows behind her. And I thought to myself, look, it's just how I am as a person. I'm like, she knows where I am. She knows I t- said it was kind of funny. And so I'll leave it up to her. And you know, <laughs> you're in that prox proximate area. And I thought, okay, like, I'm not going to push it. Maybe, you know, I don't want to, make her feel uncomfortable. Um, and that was as close as we've ever come. Um, so, you know, and, and I think I've seen some of the interviews that she's done and I think she's over it, meaning that she's moved on to a, a bunch of other projects. And, uh, you know, so if she called and wanted to talk about it or I bumped into her, I'm sure we could get a laugh out of it, but I just, I don't want to make, I'm not looking to make her uncomfortable and have a discussion that, you know, isn't going to be funny. And so she's not, 
excited about it, I would let it go. Yeah, because I, I, I was always curious about that. And because this presidency, in particular with SNL, and I'm a big SNL guy, um, die, a diehard. I've, I've probably seen every episode since I can remember as a kid. This was the first turn in the political landscape that it seemed like it just it crossed the line and went angry and vicious yeah. toward the political figures. Where if you look back in history, you know, you had uh, uh, Will Ferrell playing uh, George Bush. And even though George Bush was, go was going through his problems, Will Ferrell kind of made him a lovable guy and fun and, and affable. You had Daryl Hammond playing Bill Clinton. Yeah. And look, Bill Clinton <laughs> was going through an impeachment. But when it got to Trump and it got to you um, and in particular uh, Alec Baldwin playing Trump, it just seemed nasty. Like it, it, it seemed like too much to me. Um, and it, that was the same vibe you got, right? Yeah. And that's why I'm, I think you're absolutely right. It was angry and personal and mean as opposed to funny. I mean, when you're watching it and you're not laughing, that tells you something. And I think you're right. If you look back through history, you go even further back than you said, was Chevy Chase is Gerald Ford. Yeah. It was, they were, they were making fun of these idiosyncrasies and, and sort of missteps, but it was funny and it wasn't, it wasn't intentionally mean and that's where i think the line started to to change for them is that they didn't they didn't care about whether you were laughing they wanted to send a message i actually i've got a new book coming out in october called leading america and one of the sections that i've gotten it is all about this when you turn on late night right or even saturday live that's mm -hmm. a great example but they, they, it's always the left wing you know elizabeth warren the kamala harris's that are the guests and the mean monologue about how everything that trump does sucks mm -hmm. and i think that that's mm -hmm. it is now there, there you wonder sometimes why you don't hear things and it's because there's this dominance in big tech hollywood and and a lot of this tv about they only want to show one side which is you know conservatives are bad and and liberals are good and we're going to stock the deck stack the deck with just putting the people that that highlight the um the the perspective that we have and the ideology that we want out there so i mean you don't ever see you know pick famous republican on late night you know with kimmel or uh, fallon or colbert because they don't want that and i and, and i think that that's the problem is that they don't they don't want to, and they use this word a lot sometimes, they go humanize people. It's like they don't want you to turn on the television and see someone on the right that you go, wow, that's a really interesting, nice person. They don't like that because that doesn't fit the narrative. They want people to dislike conservatives. Yeah, and uh, and I feel like it only happened around 2016. Before that, they were more willing to have some people on, at least from the other side. I, I think – the only one now is probably Crenshaw. Crenshaw is kind of crossed over, a but that's bit, yeah. about it. A little um, bit. Yeah. Uh, but even that, but I mean, there's a couple of things. Like, first of all, like the thing about Crenshaw is that he's putting himself out there. He's done a couple of things, but he's not like some, he, he's willing to do that. I mean, like he's gone on Bill Maher and he crushed him last weekend. That was and, great. And that, but, but that's it. I mean, it's not like you're seeing Dan Crenshaw on, uh, on any of those other late night shows. Now, I don't know that Dan wants to or not. But the fact of the matter is, is that like, you know, he's willing to play a little bit of ball, but they're not reaching out trying to get a lot of these guys on air. And, and you think about a lot of the sort of the household names that are growing in the House and the Senate. And it's like I said, that there is an active effort to make sure that they don't get on air. I would say from a media perspective, if you think about it uh, as a marketing organization and media exists to sell advertising, it's not like that's why professional sports exists. That's why all this exists. Right. right. But when you take a hard side like that, and then push the narrative. It's not just if you're if if there are hard sides taken, maybe sometimes you got to take one or the other, right? But if you're the impetus in creating those sides, that is a huge that you're just cutting your fucking demographic in half. Like you're, well, but you're no, I can't I, I can't I, talk to this fifty percent or forty five percent of conser people that are conservatives anymore if I'm CNN because they're not watching my shit. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. But, but see, this is a, the point that you brought up. I love I love it because I, I write about this in the book that they it's in their financial self interest, right? To, if you look at movies that have done well that I would say are right-leaning, right? Mm -hmm. So American Sniper, um, there was one uh, about the young surfer girl or surfer, soul surfer. Mm -hmm. She's soul the surfer, lone right? survivor. And, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All these sort of, uh, you know, right-leaning. And when I say right-leaning, it's more that they're just not explicitly going out there and talking about right. left. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, 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 they exceed box office predictions. So if you're sitting in Hollywood, you go, wow, there's an audience for that, right? And 
and I wish we should want more of that. There's obviously when you see some of these documentaries that come out, they do very well. And you would think if you were Netflix or Hulu, you'd say, hey, we've got a huge audience for that content. But you don't see it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't want it. And that's where I think it's so fascinating. It's the one time when they disagree with their bottom line. Like to your point, wouldn't you want to have, if you're one of those late night guys on, to start having a couple some Republicans because it's good for ratings because Republican Trump supporters, et cetera, would tune in. Mm -hmm. Well, that that would make sense. We have made an effort not to do it. And yeah. I, I mean, look, I, I have story after story where people would say, hey, we'd love to have the show, but you know, there's no way we'd get okay to do it. And it's like, so you don't want me on not because you can't. It's just that you, you guys know that your higher ups don't approve. Right. Yeah, so they're—I mean—they're creating an ecosystem in which, long term, at least, they—they can—they're not—they can succeed in ways, but they—they they can never reach their full potential because it's never going to be even. No, well, it's not even close to even. It's like forty-three to forty-five percent of the country is conservative, and the other forty-five, forty-three to forty-five is is liberal, and some people fall in the middle, right? Forty. If I if I were to walk into an investor and say, "Hey, I've got this business." Here's my TAM, my total addressable market, mm -hmm. but I'm going to cut them in half because oh, I don't like those other half of people. Yeah. Like they would tell you to get the fuck out of their office. Oh, yeah. Right now. <laughs> like get out. Right, but, but to your point, you would say, okay, here's how this group, you know, this is the kind of stuff that they like. We should we should create an investment strategy for them. Right. This is what we should do. But they they literally, to your point, go, you know what? Let's just focus on this one half. Yeah. And in any other any other business, that would be insane. But yes. it's it's literally it's they're willing to do it because it suits their higher higher calling, which is I'd rather mm -hmm. not do it because and again I think in every scenario it makes sense for them to do it because I don't think that they want people they don't want to allow people on the conservative side to get out there mm -hmm. because I think it's, it's interesting if if I were look you you saw what happened Dan Crenshaw goes on Bill Maher this week and he literally systematically point by point deconstructs Maher's argument and crushes it right if you're watching that you go oh crap no more of that right yeah. because because what Maher wants is his little punching bags he wants to get someone up there and say like here's why Republicans suck here's why conservatives suck here's why Trump's horrible and what he doesn't want is somebody that's going to get up there and go toe to toe with them and say here's why you're wrong yeah. they can't handle that and so what do they do they go okay no more but that's like, I'm sorry. I thought we were trying to find the right answer here. Yeah. Like I, at heart, I am a scientist. I feel like we can, there's things that are gray sometimes, but for the most part, there, like there is an economy that works the best for America. That exists. Statistically speaking, from a mathematics standpoint, that is a real thing. It's a number that we could find at some point, but we're not even trying. We're just applying ideology and making the numbers work at this point. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and and look to your point, like that that Crenshaw piece with with Mar over the weekend. That was a fourteen minute evisceration that went viral. And you're right; it's going to scare everybody else from having someone like that back <laughs> on. Uh, but no one's even trying anymore, like Dan says, like at all across the board. Well, in the media, they're not trying for sure. I mean, no. But... And they, but here's the thing: they should be because without Donald Trump as president, do you think MSNBC or, or CNN would still be on the air right now, looking at their ratings? Would they even be able to be on the air if they didn't have an agenda to go after Trump? Because to me, when I look at the numbers, I'm a Hollywood guy. The ratings don't support it. Mm -hmm. um, MSNBC is, is going down <clears throat> during a pandemic, which is next to impossible. Well, the re I mean, just as a, from a business perspective, I know both of them do, especially CNN, a lot online, which mm -hmm. is where, they're, where they put a lot of their money. Got so it. it's, it's sort of huge i mean it's it's like the, that one part of the company and, and frankly in a lot of networks the news divisions aren't making what they used to but it's you know it's overall part of the still the, the whole structure i think they would still be on there's no question about it but i don't think the the fascinating thing about it is up until the pandemic and the briefings when you looked at the top 10 cable shows on television um cnn wouldn't even come close to making it there was only one show maybe two once in a while that would break one million viewers at any time ever on cnn in a 24-hour period um and, and that just tells you that they're willing you know that they're trying to they saw what msnbc did which went came from out of the gutter and became the anti-trump network which then kind of got everybody to watch um and now they're trying to figure out how can we replicate that to some degree. Yeah, but how do you monitor? Like, th this is the part that's so myopic on their part. And I, I think maybe their CEOs and, and whomever's in the front offices over there are, are really who's fucking them up probably. But, like, to monetize that, the huge 
one of the there, there's a couple of demographics in sales and advertising sales that you really want to go after, and and one of them is forty five to fifty four year old conservative, especially males, because they spend a fuckload of money on a lot of stuff, and it doesn't matter what their status in the world is or whatever the fuck, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what they're doing, what they're up to, like what they what their jobs or anything like that. But those are people who are established and have a disposable income. And as an advertiser, particularly for direct to consumer shit, which happens in media more than any other, like that's a big chunk of their advertising. That group is a particularly attractive. Mm-hmm. And so is the next one, the 55 to 65. 54 to here's, here's the thing though, in, in, in the cable world in particular, because it's different than the broadcast world, mm-hmm. where cable stations make, or at least those three networks in particular, make their real money is on a thing called carriage, right? Mm-hmm. So when you have Fios or DirecTV or whatever, mm-hmm. CNN will say, hey, to get CNN on your platform, right. you know, you need to pay us, whatever, 10 bucks a subscriber. And so they just need to show numbers. They don't care where they're from because mm-hmm. – they're getting carriage fees. The revenue that they generate from ads is it, it's increasingly helpful, but for the longest time, that was gravy. And so all they cared about was getting a good number. And that's where the difference in that model is, is that if their carriage numbers goes up, and that's where Fox has been, you know, the interesting thing is Fox always gets made fun of sometimes for its ratings. Oh, here's how many spots it had, whatever. Their real, their real sweet spot is when they go to these cable stations saying, hey, guess what? All of your people want to watch our station, yeah. so we're going to charge you, you know, thirty bucks a viewer. Yeah, because that, that's the one thing that always surprises me, and that's why I said that about CNN and MSNBC in particular. Is I know how much Anderson Cooper's making, I know how much Chris Cuomo's making for not getting a million viewers on live television. It is surprising that they could pay that, but I guess if you're saying it's coming from carriage fees, then it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but that's how long is that going to last? Yeah, I mean, with the more streaming gets popular, the less these cable companies yeah. are going to fold any minute. I don't even know right. how they're still that's, going, that, to be honest. Yeah, I, I think you're right because the, the the issue isn't the today and tomorrow. It's how do you sustain that model? Right. You know, in the future, when people say, "I'm not going to sit down and watch it on a you know my television because mm. I can go to my, my room and watch it on my iPad or whatever," and and I don't want to have to pay for a bunch of channels that I don't mm. want anymore. <laughs> um, so let's say it is Biden and Kamala Harris coming up this mm. fall, right? Is there a world in which you see them winning? Anyone who tells you there's not a world in which that happens, I think, is a liar. No matter how much I want the president to win, and I think he will win. Um, the best example I give you is is that we won Michigan last time by 10,704 votes, which is 0.22 of a percent. Um, that's that's a razor's edge. And when you look at the combined score of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, it's about 80,000 votes, which is nothing in a presidential race. And so. You, we ran against a very flawed candidate. That's not an insult to, to Clinton, but she had a hard time motivating her base. A lot of people will walk her. And so you take her horribly flawed, bad candidate and put her with anyone, then by nature, now Trump, the upside is he has a record to run on, and I think it's been one that's been successful. And frankly, more than that, he kept his word on so many of these key issues. Mm-hmm. So I think he's got a very good record to run on. But when you look at our, our elections going back frankly, to 2000 when mm-hmm. Bush v. Gore, we, we don't have blowouts, especially electorally. We didn't win as a Republican Party, Pennsylvania, um, Wisconsin, and, and uh, Michigan. I think the last time was 1988. So doing it again is putting lightning back in a bottle. And so I say that because I, I the campaign, I think, has done a phenomenal job of creating an, uh, a really robust data continuing operation since the last time with the RNC. But you know, I, I just I think that I, I hate when Republicans get complacent. They're like, oh, the president did a great job. Da, da, da. It's like, OK, well, you better understand that the left is unbelievably motivated. The AOCs of the world, they did that. They, there were congressmen in the 2018 midterm elections that are no longer congressmen because they thought to themselves, I have my district set for, you know, I have a 14 point win. I can't mm-hmm. lose. And now, they're, you know, trying to figure out how to turn on a computer. Right. Uh, and, and so I, I say that because I. I think if you can't, you, you have to understand that if we don't stay motivated and go out there and engage kind of the way the Democrats did in, in 2018, then they will win. Mm. Yeah, I look, because I, me personally, um, I think it's it's Trump by six. I, I'm saying five or six is my prediction because um, I think he's done a pretty good job with this. And then, you know, obviously we'll see if, if the coronavirus comes back. It's very rare that a president, that a sitting president in time of war or some kind of other Public disaster 
of some sort gets uh, loses a presidential election. People don't like Correct. instability in those situations. And we know yeah, but, like at, it, coronavirus is absolutely coming back in the fall. Absolutely coming back. That's how viruses work. But We'll see how like it, it won't be by November third probably right no I January or February oh, probably yeah. yeah but but you know I, I think you're right the question is everything about this Trump presidency has been unique and different and so right. look back historically and say well because I can tell you about a million things that, that you know this president's blown through and said you know guess what it used to be that way I don't care mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that's true yeah he's uh he's an enigma this guy and I wonder if uh, long term he changes the way people approach campaigns. Like, is he the Steph Curry think, of politicians? You know what I mean? I think he already has. If you look at the, the races that we see around the world, mm. you're seeing different versions. I mean, you even look at Ukraine, um, mm. a former TV star. He, I mean, like, and they, they, you know, Netanyahu has used some of his similar tactics in Israel. So I think he's definitely had a huge influence on him. And, and what I tell candidates that my company advises is, I'll say, don't, you can't be Trump. What Trump is more than anything is, is himself. He's authentic. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. You know, and so what, if you, the lesson to take away is don't try to be Trump, be yourself. Mm-hmm. Don't be a fake politician <laughs> that acts like you care when you don't. What makes Trump Trump is the authenticity factor that he, no one thinks he's, you know, BS in them. Right. Um, and I think that that's, that's going to be something that does change. Things. But it's going to take a while because I, I don't think that you see, I mean, Joe Biden's definitely not you know, Trump esque. No, <laughs> no. He's uh, uh, the opposite. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know what they're, I don't know what's going on with that guy. I feel like maybe he's a hand puppet, like a, yeah. Somebody's- and look, we're a comedy show, Sean. And, and to the SNL point, I have a hard time, and, and this, I'm being genuine when I say this, I have a hard time making fun of Biden. Because what I feel that we're seeing is like genuine dementia. Yeah. Um, and I have a hard time as a comedian making fun of Joe Biden, especially somebody who served the, the country for the last 47 years in, in some form of um, you know, politics. And I just it, it's sad to me almost in a way. And I don't know how the next six, you know, eight months are going to go for him uh, for this election. But I feel like they're going to try to hide them as much as possible. And and trot out probably Barack and Michelle. Uh, have you heard otherwise, um, you know, what the strategy is well, with Biden? I, heard him, I, I mean, Barack Obama is the most popular figure in the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. Michelle Obama is he's probably equally loved. So I think that the more that they can hug Obama, the better for them. And frankly, I think the more that, that you know, I've told people – Endorsements don't really matter that, that much on their face. It's what people do behind after they endorse you. Like, mm-hmm. does Bernie Sanders go hit the campaign trail? Does he tell his donors to give to you? Because if he does, that's great. But if he just says, hey, I endorse Joe Biden, you know, it's, right. it's like great. Um, I mean, that's so been the rub, on, I, that's I, been I the rub on Sanders for a long time is that he wanted to take up the mantle of the Democratic Party so he could run for a major party, but he didn't do shit down ballot ever. Yeah. Right. And I, I don't know that his base, look, his base was run on everything that's opposite of Biden, you know? Um, so why why are the Bernie bros going to come out and vote for Biden? Yeah. I just don't see it. Um, I mean, I think some of them will and some of them won't because there's obviously a huge hatred of Trump and the Democratic Party. So yeah. they have to figure out what they hate more. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I do think that that's going to be the million dollar question is how many of them show up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about charity. Yes, you were. Look, you do a lot of things. You're, on the uh, you're board a best-selling of author, a, a New York Times best-selling author. Yep. You've got a no, new book coming out that's available for pre-order right now. Why don't you tell us about that, and then tell us about the charity you're working? Yeah, on. and you spent 21 years in the Navy, which is basically the military for people who don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> um, he wasn't ready for that so, shit talking right there. So, uh, I, I would just say this first and foremost, like the easiest thing for anyone who wants to find out stuff is Sean Spicer dot com. Mm. Uh, you can go sign up. But I've got a book coming out October 13th, a leading America, as I, we were talking about before. And it really looks at our culture and how Hollywood academics society the media really stack the deck against conservatives and it just and it's not like an angry book it's just here are these examples and here's what you don't realize is sort of this subtle indoctrination that's going on mm-hmm. um, obviously this, the other thing is i've got a show on newsmax television that airs every night at 6 p.m we we try to do a very conversational thing um just just sit back and and you know for example then they're talking to the guests and we we're talking about you know okay if the government tells you that you could go out that's can you go out, but would you go out? And I think that's the kind of thing that's always like it's it's one thing to be able to do something. It's another thing that would you do it? So right. we, we have a really fun, interesting discussion with folks that 
doesn't necessarily happen on other shows. So it's six o'clock every day at Newsmax. And like I said, all of that is at SeanSpicer.com. But, you know, I, I do work for a lot of, uh, do a lot of work for veterans organizations. Mm-hmm. One of them is the Independence Fund that um, provides track, primarily it does a lot of great things. Yeah, but one of the big things it does is provide these track wheelchairs to, to uh, service members who have mobility issues. Either they have just straight up mobility issues, they've lost a leg or two. And we get them these wheelchairs that look like little tanks and they mm-hmm. can, you know, and it's funny. I mean, like, I know this sounds like a really weird saying, but I had one of the veterans at one point said, I can go for a walk now, right? Mm. Because the current chair didn't provide him that. And he lived in, you know, the outdoors, uh, or he right. had a big outdoor tract of land and he wanted to be able to. And, and in their mind, that is to them the same kind of walk that you and I take for granted. When we mm. go down the street, we want to collect our thoughts. And this guy had to have somebody push him all the time. And he thought, I just want to be alone. And it's such a transformational thing to give someone their independence back. So the Independence Fund is doing this thing, and we're, we're doing a challenge where you can go talk about, in a funny way, how you're spending the quarantine, and, mm-hmm. and then you got to play it on. And and so independencefund.org has all the details. But it's a way of, you know, it's kind of like the ice bucket challenge. You, you, mm-hmm. If you are all in, you hashtag RAF, which is resilience at home, or resilient at home, RAF. Um, and then you can challenge someone to, to join you. If they do it, you're, you know, you hopefully you'll donate 25 bucks. Uh, to the cause. If not, you can say, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to post a video of me saying quarantining at home and I'll right. donate. <laughs> right. But it's, it's a way, it's, it's trying to be, a way because right now what we're seeing is a lot of these folks, if you think about it, if you have, um, uh, I'm, the word's escaping me now, but, but sort of if you're prone to infection because mm. of the injuries that you sustain, you can't necessarily have the people come in that you used to. You, you're, you know, in a lot of cases, the, the spouse, the loss of job is having a hard time. And so it really limits what they can and can't do. And, and there's a lot of financial needs among our wounded service members. And so we're trying to provide them with help. And, you know, whether that's paying some groceries or utilities or whatever. Um, and so if we can get this, you know, if, if the Independence Fund can help raise some money, we can help make sure that, that a lot of these veterans get the support they need right. in a moment that is just so and there's another uh, element to that that I was talking to uh, Sarah Verardo about, who runs the Independence Fund. I mean, one of the un- one of the unexpected consequences, I suppose, of this whole quarantine thing is what he was talking about. A lot of these guys and women who were uh, immunocompromised because of wartime injuries are now finding that. Well, I mean, they've found themselves with their spouse as their primary care provider, for lack of a better phrase. Mm-hmm. Um, and because children are disgusting. You know, keeping the chi- the children and the immunocompromised person in the same spot, especially after things start to open back up yep. slowly, is going to become problematic. And and you know, it is like he says, a lot of people have been furloughed, lost their jobs, and stuff like that. There's a lot of need for that. We don't think about those secondary and tertiary effects of stuff like this happening. Like people that were already under a lot of strain have now been kicked in the nuts basically by this situation. Like I'm fine. You're fine, Sean. Obviously we're all fine. Yeah. But there's a lot of people who aren't. And this is a big group of women. It's people. It's mostly women. Obviously most of the people in the military are male. So most of the injuries are male. It's mostly women who are taking care of these guys and uh, they're kind of fucked right now. Yeah. For like, you know, a better phrase. So it's well, you think like, about this, your point, right? <clears throat> the one that's interesting is let's say that you're, you're the spouse and you're the primary caregiver and, and you've got suddenly um, someone who's, uh, you know, immune system is compromised. Mm-hmm. You got to send the nanny away or the babysitter. So now you're becoming caregiver, babysitter, teacher to the kid. So this strain on some of these households is unbelievable. And so we're going to try to help alleviate some of that strain. Yep. Yeah. And by the way, uh, children are disgusting. My, I've got two young kids. Uh, Dan was saying children are disgusting. They are. They're, they're t- my, I watched my kid eat a ravioli off of a, an old plate that was in the dishwasher this morning. I couldn't stop his little hand from going into his mouth yep. fast enough. And I was like, ah, oh, God. I mean, well, I'm, I'm getting AIDS at the end of this. Like, yeah, today. it's, it's a, look, they have a very tactile mind. Yeah, like, they don't it's care. It's food. I'm hungry. I'm eating it. Yes. The end. Yes. Right. Uh, and re- repeat it. Where, where can everybody, uh, what, what, what's the website that everybody can go to? Independencefund.org. It'll have all the information mm-hmm. there. Perfect. Uh, Sean, this is the point in the show where we get to the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the man you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? I always defer to my dad. He's mm-hmm. a great guy. He, uh, so I'll, I'll throw that one out there for you. Great. Great. Uh, last question. Um, yeah. because you've been a, a part of the RNC for so long, 
Who do you see on the horizon in 2024? Great question. Um, I think we're going to, I mean, I think Mike Pence is definitely going to lead the pack on that because of being vice president for eight years. Um, I think Nikki Haley is potentially going to be a candidate. She's very attractive as a candidate. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't mean aesthetically, because, but, but as, as a, she was a successful governor, um, she was outstanding as ambassador of the UN. Mm-hmm. And so she's really, um, she would be great. I think Tom Cotton from Arkansas could be very attractive to a lot of folks, especially if he's so tough on China. Um, I would have to say that by far, I think those are going to be the leading candidates. But, you know, what we see sometimes is is that candidates, you look at Gretchen Whitmer on the Democratic side, mm-hmm. she's been in office 18 months. I already talked about her being VP. Obama was in office for like a day and a mm-hmm. half. And, they were <laughs> and so I, I just think there's also an element of this being a little too early, but I don't think, I think that Pence and, um, You know, there's talk that Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, Mm -hmm. could run. Mm -hmm. But I I think it's too early to tell. Um, But I would say, uh, unequivocally, Mike Pence and Nikki Haley are probably the two front runners. I like Nikki Haley. It's it's funny because that that was my prediction. I said Nikki Mm -hmm. Haley for 2024. I'd love to see Crenshaw in the mix somehow. Um, I just think he's one of those guys that is able to reach out to both sides and at least hear an argument. Whereas I feel like a lot of people aren't, and me personally, I'm a fan of Dan Crenshaw, so I hope he's in the mix at some point. But if you put Haley and Crenshaw together, whoo, that would be a that would be a powerhouse for 2024. Go, go hey, go to whatever go, go daddy and register that now. You just be able to sell it off. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Haley for America. I'm sure it already exists. Oh, I'm sure it exists. Right? No, no, Haley Crenshaw. Isn't that what you said? Yeah, yeah, Haley yeah. Crenshaw. Yeah, that, that, that's what I say. But uh, he's talking about Haley for America as far as president. So. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Um, since you've been in the White House long enough, any shot that Ivanka would ever do it? Uh, I would never say never anymore, but I, I just don't I don't think that that's in the cards. I, I just figured with, you know, Jared Kushner doing a lot of those or at least the media says he's doing a lot of those deals behind the scenes. Um, you know. Yeah, but, but one, thing, one thing that um, that's important to know is that, look, look, politics, the one thing about politics, and we were talking about this a little on the Democratic side, is true on the Republican side, is that primaries in particular are base, are, are base, base based, mm-hmm. <laughs> meaning that, okay, and, you know, Ivanka has been, um, you know, supporting a lot of causes that might not go over too well. She's been an unbelievable supporter of her father. She's done a lot of great work on, on women. But I think if you're talking about a Republican primary where pro-life issues, pro-gun issues are going to come up, you've got folks that have been very out in front on those issues. And there's a key constituency of evangelicals in some places like Iowa. Evangelicals are a huge part of that makeup in the primary vote, even in South Carolina. And so you know, again, just as a that whether they, I think there's a difference between what you're asking, who would be a good candidate, mm-hmm. right, and who who's who will emerge, because there's two different things. I think that Dan is a great guy. Um, I, I he's he's just his heart's in the right place, as you said. He's got great experience, um, and he's you know he's got all the right credentials in terms of willing to listen, focused on the big picture, but but. You know, you go, okay, is he ready to run? I I don't know. But I wouldn't, it's nothing personal against Dan or Mm -hmm. Ivanka or anyone else. But if you're just seeing analytically, you know, it's there's a difference between someone that you like and someone that you actually think could do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the fun part about all of our jobs is we get to speculate and guess. And we have no idea at the end of the day. And if you would have said Trump was president in 2016, none of us saw that. That's why I said I'd never say never. (laughs) Exactly. What about Michelle Obama for Biden's VP? Would you say never to that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Same here. So right. he just said never. I mean, yeah. And again, just I, look, if she did it, I think he'd take her in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I think he might but, have a but, good chance at winning but, with her, too. I don't think he has a oh, chance yeah. without somebody but, like that. You got to say to yourself, like, why was Michelle Obama? She's been first lady for eight years. And you really want to put your fan. I, I just I, I don't think and she's never really had an interest in policy. So, yeah. Look, she, it would be it would be an, it would be a pretty spectacular ticket. She'd be pretty formidable. But I also just don't think she has any interest. To me, that would be like a really good UFC fight. You know what I mean? Like, not that they're actually going to scrub, but that would be a fucking that would be a an amazing campaign to watch. Oh yeah, from a talent perspective, because she's very good at drawing and holding audiences as well. And I don't think that Biden Harris can win. I don't no, think it'll, I, I don't think there's any. She's one of the most. She's like not on Hillary Clinton's level, but she is a very unliked person. Like yeah. the people who like her like her, but the people who dislike her dislike her way more than the people who like her like her. In my opinion. Like it's okay. people dislike. Her I agree. Much. And Michelle Obama had the number one selling memoir in the world. Um, so I, I think you would give Biden a better shot. I just don't think it's going to happen. 
uh, at all. Well, and uh, Sean, uh, thanks for joining us today, man. You're one of those guys well, where I could talk to you for, for the next nine hours. I mean, I, I wonder if you ever I got drive, loose. I'm going to home from the studio, though, so I can't sit there and have a drink with you. I know. I wish you could. I wish you could. And, uh, you know, I'd love to ask you if you ever got down in the in the Lincoln bedroom, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, for another show. <laughs> Now you're starting to blush a little bit. Dan got you on the Navy one. I'm happy I got you on the yeah, you, bedroom one. You weren't ready for me to talk shit to you about the Navy. I feel like I feel like I, w- I was expecting you to talk some shit back Navy, to me. You know, I, I look. I I think anyone in the Navy understands. You don't even need to just to dignify it. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, you're an awesome dude, man. We appreciate you stopping by, drinking bros. Yep. Sean Spicer, Anthony, Anthony Holloway. I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone.